Pastor Wayne here again with you from Alpine Bible Church, and today I want to spend our time together talking about God's encouraging words. Last week in our discussion about faith over fear, uh, we read several verses explaining some of what God says about fear. And, and I'll tell you what, I was pretty encouraged by those verses uh, as we listened to them. And, and I think several other people were as well as I got a little bit of feedback on that. So it seemed like a good idea today if we spent some time looking for uh, added encouragement from God's word. I think we're in a time when we could use a little encouragement. And so let's look at God's word today and look for his encouragement. And, uh, you know, as you're aware, there's so many passages that we can find in the Bible that talk about God's encouragement. There's just a ton of stuff out there. And, and since we're only going to be able to cover a few today, I'm going to focus on the New Testament. But please know, as I'm sure many of you do, that there's so much encouragement to be found in the entirety of God's word. And so while we're going to look at a few from the New Testament, don't let that stop you from getting into God's word and finding more encouragement from it. Uh, today, if you're okay with it, uh, I would like to start with one of my favorite passages that's always been so encouraging to me. It comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And the Bible says this, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus is encouraging all those who are, who are weary, who are worn out from the burdens of life. And, and I got a feeling that's a lot of us right now. But he says, come unto him and he'll give you rest. The word rest in this verse is, is refresh. Jesus says, come unto me and I will refresh you. I will give you rest. But then he also goes on and he says this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And now this isn't a burdensome yoke because he was just telling us that, that, that those that are weary and heavy laden that are overburdened need to come to him for rest. So this yoke is talking about learning his truths from him. Come unto me and, and yeah, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm meek and gentle, I'm gentle and humble. And, and he says, and you're going to find rest for your souls. And this time, and this is really good, the word that Jesus uses for rest here really talks about an inner tranquility, a, an inner peace uh, or calm, an inner calm. And so Jesus is saying this, that as, as we learn more and more about him, we realize this inner peace and calm that we have in him. That's the rest that he's offering us. And Paul tells the Corinthian church that one of the reasons God gives us this, this inner peace and this inner calm and, and really an inner comfort comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 3 and 4. He says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we are able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. In other words, God's saying, listen, I'm giving you peace and I'm giving you comfort and I love giving you that peace and comfort, but there's a reason that I'm doing that is so that you can encourage others when they're going through something. The word, uh, the word affliction there means any kind of trouble. Anything that's going on, God wants to give you comfort, and he oftentimes does that through his people, and his people who have already experienced something similar to what you're going through. And so he says, he says I want to give you comfort, and, and he says, I'm going to do it by you getting comfort from those that have already experienced something that you have, and, and God's already comforted them. And it's good to read and good to understand that. And, and what happens when we're able to help someone and to, to comfort them the way God has comforted us, then we're able to rejoice with them when God gives them his peace in their hearts and in their minds. Listen to what Philippians 4 verses 4 through 7 says. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now listen to this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The reality and the depth of God's peace is really pretty hard to, to grasp for us. It, it says it's... Uh, 
Philippians says it surpasses all comprehension. Comprehension. It's pretty hard for us to grasp, but God promises that we have it through his indwelling Holy Spirit. We have his peace. And we, because we have that confidence that we possess it, then we can rest in it. And we can help others by being an encouragement to them with it. God not only gives us his peace and his comfort to encourage others, but he promises this. He promises that all things are going to work together for his good. And as we desire his purposes in our lives, that's a pretty encouraging thing. And one of the reasons that's a truth is because he's for us. It's so encouraging to know that God is for us, to know that we're important to him. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says this. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And then just down in verse 31, he then says this. What shall we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that for a minute. God is for us. How encouraging is that? God is for us. So since God is for us, who really can be against us? And the answer is honestly no one. No one can be against us because we are more than conquerors, it says later in Romans. We're more than conquerors through him who loves us with a perfect love. Listen to how he puts it in verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or perils or a sword? And, and he, he's asking that question, but it's really a rhetorical question because once again, the answer is no one. And he answers the question down in verses 37 through 39. Listen to this. It says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. How encouraging is that? Nothing or no one can separate us from the love of God that we have in Jesus Christ. It just can't happen. Um, that's a wonderful truth that we can hold on to, and, and I pray that encourages you. And, and the truth of the matter is, is Jesus desires that we understand this love, that we get to know this great love that he has for us. Um, it, even though the depth of his love, again, just like God's peace, the depth of it is really hard for us to comprehend. Listen to the way Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19 put it. It says, For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and listen to this, and to know the love of Christ, which sur surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. <laughs> understanding Christ's love for salvation, understanding Christ's love in our daily lives. As we get to understand that, really, there's few things that can be more encouraging for us than to grow in our understanding of Christ's love for each one of us. There's just not much out there that can be more encouraging for us. The more we understand his love, the more it's going to affect our lives in a positive way. And 1 John really tries to help us understand that in several different places. And, and not only to see the depth of Christ's love for us, but to see the cost of it. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, I'm just going to read the first half of that verse, but it says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are, or and such are we. We are the children of God because of God's love for us. In chapter 4 and verse 7 of 1 John it says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We know God because of his love for us. And we know that we're born of him because of his love for us. Chapter, seven, or chapter 4 down in verses 9 and 10, it says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God loved us so much, as everybody knows in John 3, 16, that he sent his son to be the payment in full, to pay the price in full for our sins. 
That's an incredible love that God shows for us. And again, in chapter 4, down in verses 16 through 19, we have this. It says, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Isn't that good? I mean, we come to know it and then believe it. That's an important step in understanding God's love. He goes on, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected in us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. We talked about that last week. Now, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the only one who fears is not perfected, not, or excuse me, the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Those are such valuable words for us, so important for us. God's great love for us is incredible. And it allows us through belief in him to be called his children, to, to know that we belong to him. But it also helps us to know him more and to understand him more. It causes us to accept the love that he has for us so much, the, the great love that he has for us because he sent his son to die on the cross for us, to pay the price for our sins. And it's perfected in us because he is love. His love is perfected in you and I. That means it's completed in you and I because he is love and he is in us. And we're able to love him back and we're able to love others because he loved us first. You know, God's love is really the basis for everything we do. When you honestly think about it, you step back and you say, okay, what's, what's really moving me? What's really motivating me? I think you're going to learn that it's God's love. And, and, and Lord willing, get your love for him in return. And so it's, that's what makes our relationship with God so encouraging is his love. And, and also it's the fact that we know that he started what he has started in us through his love. We know that he's going to continue and we know that he's going to finish it. And again, it's all by his love part. And, and the reason is, is because he's faithful. It doesn't depend on you and I and our abilities or our failures that none of it depends on any of that. It all depends on God's faithfulness. Philippians chapter 1 of verse 6 says this, it says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's going to complete it. That word perfect means complete. God is going to complete what he started in you. Isn't that comforting? There's two really valuable things in that verse. First, God started it, and then God's going to complete it. See how it doesn't depend on us at all? Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, I'll go to verse 23. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Listen to this, for he who promised is faithful. You see, the whole point of all of that stuff that he says, let us do this, let us do this. And the whole point of all of it is because God is faithful. And Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, and this kind of ties it all back in together. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's, so, here's what's good, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter or the finisher of your faith. Once again, perfection is completeness. It's finishedness. God is going to complete whatever he started in you. God is going to complete whatever he started in me. And because he is the author and the, author and the perfecter of our faith, because he started it, he's going to finish it. And it's all based on his faithfulness. He is faithful. What a wonderful promise that is. And that's why that First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, that's why uh, Peter says this about believers. It's so good. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, 
so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. <laughs> we can be encouraged because we are people chosen by God to be his own possession. That's amazing to me. God loves you and I so much he wants us to belong to him. He wants us to be his possession. And why does he want that? Why did he do that? So that we can proclaim him to the world. So that we can proclaim that he's brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Into the incredible light that he is. All because of his faithfulness. It has nothing to do with us. Just our ability to tell people about him and talk to people about him. And our desire to do that. I want to leave you with two more quick verses that I, they're, they're promises of God that I think two are the most comforting truths in God's word, uh, especially as it relates to our relationship with him. The first one comes from Hebrews chapter 13 of verse five. It says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, listen to this, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. God has said this himself. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm with you always. And the other thing that's so encouraging for me is 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The same God who promises all of the comfort and the encouragement that we've been talking about today and so much more than we've been able to talk about today. He says, I'm never going to leave you. He says, I'm always with you. He says, and because I indwell each one of you. That's why I'm not gone. I'm not I'm I'm not taken off. Uh, and, and to me, I just can't really think of anything much more encouraging than that. That is such a tremendous encouragement. You know, we have a, so many wonderful promises from God. And again, as you know, as you're fully aware, we've only scratched the surface here today. There's literally hundreds that we could look at from God's word. And so that's one of the things I want to encourage you to do today is when you get time, take some time in God's word, get into God's word and, and, and really look for his promises. Remembering God's promises and, and holding on to the truths that they contain, that's really the encouragement that we need right now. That's, that's the encouragement that we need to deal with whatever comes our way. Uh, that's the encouragement that we need daily uh, for the challenges that we might be facing daily. And it's, it's definitely the encouragement that we read, need right now to, to deal with the things that are going on now. We, we just are in an odd, such an odd situation, but we, we can be encouraged by God's word to deal with whatever, whatever we've, we're facing, whatever we're dealing with. Lean on the amazing truths of your God for peace, for comfort, for encouragement. That's my encouragement to you today. Look to God's word for encouragement. There's so much there and there's so much that will be able to carry you through whatever is happening in your life. Let's talk to him now about it. Lord, thank you so much that, that we can lean on you for encouragement. There's so much encouragement in the truths of your word. There's, there's so much encouragement in the fact that you indwell us and you're with us all the time. And we know that, Lord, and we know that we can depend on you in whatever circumstance and situation we're in. I pray that each one of us would have a desire to, to look to your word and look to be encouraged by you throughout the coming days and weeks and months. And we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. I uh, look forward to getting together with you again soon. Thank you.